Today's lecture is all about the consistency between my internal self-image and my behavior. And think about during the session today, it's all about this consistency be between my thoughts internally and my behavior and my thoughts. And of course that makes sense. Most of us kind of have a desire for consistency. It makes sense. What I say is what I do. And things internally are the same. For example, I have thoughts that are aligned. Mostly because it, it makes good sense for myself. It's also valid by society. Generally, it's socially accepted. So, for example, if I say, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you with this. And then I'm actually going to do it. So I can count of people. That's why it's socially valued. It's also something that shortcuts through complexities of life. In the sense that if somebody is t talks to me and somebody says things, I can kind of count on it. Of course, that makes sense. But let's go into detail and see how it can also frame us. So, once we make a choice or take a stand, we will kind of encounter personal or interpersonal pressures to behave consistent with that commitment. And sometimes the commitment we take or do or the things we say are not entirely smart. It might not be entirely consistent with the behavior we actually do. So let's look into it. So first of all, remember the cognitive dissonance theory. So Festinger's original idea was that if we have inconsistent cognitions, we get into some kind of aversive state. This is unpleasant. So people will distort or do something to align their ideas, to align their thoughts or cognitions, or their behavior. So all this, the behavior, the thoughts, have to be in harmony in some way. Okay. So, sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes we actually, as you know with the old BEM, we do something and then to kind of make it consistent, we come up with our attitude. So if I actually came into doing something small, I might, well, I bought organic food one day and some, suddenly I'm kind of, my attitude is organic food is good. Maybe I even bought it by coincidence, but now I'm into organic food. And often, this is actually due to the fact that we seek for information. As you know about uh, the uncertainty principle, if I'm not quite sure about how I feel, I'll look for information. So, especially important, this principle is especially important if I actually tell people what I think. And this is interesting. So, consistency makes sense. And let's, look, look, let's look at like, some few examples. Okay, first of all, if you actually can get people to say they want to do a specific behavior, they often do. So, for example, if you have a restaurant, and one of the problems in the restaurant is people booking a table and then not showing up. So if you actually get them to say, please call us if you change your plans. Well, not that many people really call, because that's just something the waiter says when he receives the booking. But if you ask people, Will you please call us if you change your plans and get people to say, yes, I will. Well, then it actually raises by 200% or it raises from 10 to 30%. Just that simple sentence makes the change. So this is just a simple way. So people are consistent with what they actually say. So I made a bit, a bit, a tiny, tiny little bit commitment to actually doing something and people do it more likely. And remember, this is just a sing it's almost the same request. It's just the wording of it. You get people to say yes. Very small change in words actually makes a large effect. So isn't this Furby really sweet? Yes. But the way Furby is marketed is to make you buy it. Of course it is, but also to buy it in a specific manner. It will trick you into buying it in a specific way. The problem with Furbies and toys in general is that there are peaks during the year, especially at Christmas. Most people buy a lot of toys at Christmas, but not that many toys in January. So that is a problem for the manufacturers. If you have to have these peak productions, you have to hire in people, and then in January you have to fire people, that's not that good. So the easiest way to produce it is with, without production peaks. So what do they actually do? Well, they use consistency to actually sell in the right way. 
So, in November, in December, they do massive marketing on TV. The commercials and the little guy here sits and says, Oh, I want this fat baby. Really great. And the father is a good father. He's consistent. He's valued by society. He says, Whoa, Santa will bring you a Furby. Of course he will. And everybody's happy. The small kid is happy. And he says, Well, I'll make sure that Santa will get a Furby for you. Or maybe I will get it for you. <laughs> it doesn't always make sense. But then, in December, they just produced the same amount as it usually does. So they sold out. So just before Christmas, they're actually out of Furbies. But this dad made a promise to his son. He said that Santa would bring a Furby. Now Santa is bringing other toys, but not the Furby. So in January, when Furbies are back in the stores, this parent walks out and buys a Furby for his kid because he did promise it. He wants to be consistent. And this is actually the way Furbies are marketed in some sense. And this kind of makes the dad consistent. And it makes the manufacturers have a stable production. This is smart. So, if I can get you to make a commitment that is a stand or go to a record, say something, especially the larger crowd, I can make you tell, tell your commitment or show your commitment. Well, I'm actually set the stage for this kind of automatic, maybe ill-considered consistency with the earlier commitment. So, let's look into how this is actually done. For example, now we have the American Cancer Society very close to what we're going to do. So, in this experiment, what they did in 1980, they made three groups and they actually just called them. Either they called them and asked, we want to volunteer for fundraising for three hours with the American Cancer Society, or they just called someone and asked if they would agree to perform behavior if somebody asked them. So, just calling them and saying, would you do this? And they ask about other things as well. So there's kind of several questions. And one of the questions in this survey was, if the American Cancer Society called you, would you agree to walk out and collect money for them for three hours? And if you're sitting there, it's kind of, it doesn't really take anything from you to say, of course I would. I have this positive self-image. I'm the good guy. I'm the good person. I want to do behaviors like this. But what happens then if somebody actually calls you and asks you to do this behavior afterwards? Of course, if you just call them and ask for actually walking out and, um, and, t and collecting money, well, not that many say yes. It kind of makes sense. So the guy, when they ask for the hypothetical, uh, hypothetical um, behavior, would you do it? Well, a lot of people said yes. But a lot of those people actually did it. And that makes sense, of course, if you already agreed. But remember, now we're not, when you have to consider the choice, the option, will I actually do this behavior when there's no real behavior that's, it's, it's easy for me to do this. I just have to say yes. Well, that actually makes a lot of people who would probably have said no if they had the direct request say no. But now, it's because there's no, there's kind of no cost. I just have to say, yes, I'm the kind of guy that would have the behavior. As soon as I've done that, I've set the stage for this way, consistency behavior. So actually, most of those people all so agreed to do it. There's a huge amount of research in this, showing that exactly these kinds of requests actually make people do this. So, one technique for actually making people stop smoking is to, you know, the problem with non-smoking campaigns and non-smoking attempts is that people stop smoking for a short period of time and then start again. One way to kind of enhance the effect is to ask the person who wants to stop smokes, ask him for the five most important persons in his life and write to them I'm starting to stop smoking now. I'm off the smokes. No more cigarettes. If then he starts again, he really shows off inconsistency. And then actually works. And especially the more people you tell, 
the more it works. So this is a way to enhance, of course it, not, it doesn't always work, but it works better if you actually go out and make a public commitment, now I'm off the cigarettes. There are other ways to kind of go this, go public on these choices. One way is uh, negotiations in the courtroom, mediation. Well, if you actually started with people being in the same room and state their interest and the price they want, and then afterwards putting two people into two different rooms and then you start to mediate by walking from room to room, that actually, well, everybody in public heard what I wanted, the price I wanted. So now it's difficult for me to be inconsistent. I don't want to go down in price or up in price because everybody, everybody heard what I said. So if you're instead in, in the same room, in public, state your interests, but not the price, and instead give, put people into different rooms and then make them state the price and then mediate by walking from room to room, then a lot of more settlements are actually made due to the fact that now people don't have to be consistent to what they said because now nobody heard it. There's not this commitment made in the beginning. There's actually an excellent way to make more negotiations successful. We have a general principle we would call foot in the door and that is actually to make exactly this with starting out with asking for something small and then ask for something larger. As soon as people have kind of aligned with the way or the picture created in their mind, that is, you ask for something small and people start thinking, I am this kind of person who would do this. Even though it didn't take anything from them because it was a small request. Then afterwards you ask for something large. For example, it could be you ask for something hypothetical and then you realize the hypothesis. Let's look at some ideas. So again, a survey with the American Heart Association and here ba basically the overall idea is we want people to volunteer for the um, American Heart Association. <coughs> and you make two requests in this experiment. The first request, would you wear a button, just a small button on your shirt show, that shows support for the American Heart Association. That doesn't really take anything from me, just putting on a small button. A second request would be, would you volunteer for three hours to sit in an info booth, hand out brochures and about heart disease prevention? That's a somewhat larger request, right? So we have three groups. One control group, they only get the second request. You just get, would you volunteer for three hours? We get a second group. They kind of get the first request, would you wear the button? And then immediately you ask them, would you also volunteer for three hours? Or, you actually ask people, would you wear this button? And two days later you ask them, will you also volunteer for three hours? So what happens when two days passes? Because the idea is that if I get people to wear this button, very small request. Well, if I wear this button, so I must be the kind of person who concerned the I'm, I'm concerned about heart diseases. I'm, I kind of want to do that something for this, for this case. So this actually changes my self-image. And then I would actually like to stand at the booth. So what does the result show? Well, the control group, there's actually a lot of people wanting to do this. Almost a quarter of all everybody. Almost more than 25%. So the control group just says, well, a lot of people want to do this. But if you ask people for the two requests at the same time, first the small, then the rest. It kind of becomes too much. I just said yes to wearing this button. No, I don't want to. I'm already doing something. But if you change people's self-picture, that is, if you get people first to wear this button, it doesn't really take anything, and then now we've affected the way they look at themselves, then almost 60% are willing to stand at the booth. So just changing people's self-picture gradually works.